الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين so welcome brothers and sisters to the weekly lecture series and as you know by now uh, we have been using weeks and continue to continuing to use the coming weeks to prepare ourselves for Ramadan and we've entitled um, or themed these these few weeks of the weekly lecture series reflections as we prepare for Ramadan and in our last few segments we have been looking at and reflecting upon the ayat from the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed fasting and those ayat as we mentioned previously are verses 183 through 187 of Surah Al-Baqarah, the second surah of the Quran. And we have now reached ayah number 186. And 186 reads, Allah says, and if, he says what means, and if my servants ask you, O Muhammad, regarding me, I am indeed close to them. I respond to the invocation of the supplicant when he calls upon me. So let them respond to me and believe in me that they might be guided aright. Let's begin, as we comment on this ayah, by mentioning Sabab Nuzuliha, the circumstances that prompted its revelation. The scholars of Tafsir have mentioned that an Arabi, a Bedouin, came to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Aqaribun Rabbuna Fanunaji, Am Ba'idun Fanunadi. He said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, is our Lord close to us? such that we can speak to him softly and have a private secret conversation with him that no one else can hear? Or is he far away from us, such that we need to, we need to call upon him in a loud voice, in an elevated tone, so that he will hear us? And in response to the query of this Bedouin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah, إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ أَنِّي and if my servants ask you about me, O Muhammad, let them know, I'm sorry, I am indeed near to them. I am indeed near to them. Now there's something significant about this ayah. This ayah is what we call ayatun min ayat al-su'al. It's one of the verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a question that the Prophet has been asked or could potentially or will likely be asked. So there are lots of verses in the Quran, or several verses in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if they ask you this, O Muhammad, if they ask you that, they ask you this, or they have asked you that, they will potentially ask you this. And all of those verses in the Quran are followed by the word. And I'll give you some examples. I'll give you a few examples. One example comes from the same surah that we're currently looking at. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 215. In that verse, Allah says, He says, O oh Muhammad, they ask you concerning what they should spend. They can ask you concerning spending. Say, notice he told the Prophet, say, whatever you spend, should be spent upon your parents or your near relatives and so on and so forth. Tayyib, there's another verse in the same surah, verse 219, Surah Al-Baqarah 219, Allah says, قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفِيهِمَا He says, O oh Muhammad, they ask you concerning intoxicants and games of chance. Say, قُلْ Say, O Muhammad, in these intoxicants, I'm sorry, intoxicants and games of chance, there is benefit 
I'm sorry, there is much sin. I'm sorry, there's much sin and some benefit for people. But the sin contained in them is greater than the benefit. Another example, I'll give you one more example just to you know illustrate how this works in the Quran generally, typically. Allah says in Surah Al-Isra, the 17th Surah, verse number 85, He says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي They ask you, O Muhammad, concerning the soul, the spirit. Say, again, قُلْ Say, O Muhammad, the spirit is from the command of my Lord. So once again, once again, in all of these examples, and in more examples in the Quran, every time Allah mentioned a su'al, they ask you, they will ask you, they could potentially ask you. He told the Prophet, say this. But in this particular ayah, it's the only one in the Quran where Allah mentioned a su'al and didn't tell the Prophet to say. It's instead Allah answered directly. Yes, al wa ida salaka ibadi anni and if about me. In, I am indeed near to them without saying قُلْ and the reason for that is this is a subtle way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifying something very important for us to realize and that is that the Prophet is a wasit he is an intermediary between us and Allah in terms of tabligh al-risala in terms of conveying the message from Allah Allah doesn't speak, tell us directly what to believe, doesn't tell us what's halal and haram, doesn't tell us how to worship him, what rituals we should perform. He doesn't tell us that directly, but rather he tells us that through the vehicle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So the Prophet in that sense is a wasit. He is an intermediary between us and Allah. Tabligh risala, conveying the message. But the context here is not the context of conveying the message, but the context of a dua, the context of invoking Allah, supplicating to Allah, wal ibadah, and worshiping Him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make it unequivocally clear to His worshippers that when it comes to a dua, calling upon Him, and it comes to an ibadah, worshiping Him, there should be no intermediary, not even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in this context, he didn't say قُلْ to make it clear to us that we're not supposed to have any intermediary between us and Allah in Allah's worship. ثُمَّ ذلك, What is حَقِيقَةَ dua? What is the reality of supplicating to Allah, calling upon Allah, invoking Allah? And this is very important. The scholars of Islam have mentioned that the reality of a dua is إِذْحَارِ الْإِفْتِقَارِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالتَّبَرِّ مِنْ الْحَوْلِ وَالْقُوَّةِ إِلَّا لَهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَالْإِسْتِشْحَارُ لِلْذُلَّةِ وَالْمَتُ الْإِبَادَةِ They have said, describing and defining the, the reality of a dua, it is a willful display of one's desperate neediness for Allah, denying the possession of any power or capability except what stems from Him, Subhana, and what He provides, and being fully cognizant of our meekness, and all of these collectively are the distinguishing features of true worship. And it is the opposite, the antithesis of arrogance. And so a dua, when a person really makes dua, really supplicates, it's a sign of their humility and a sign that they are not arrogant. And when a person doesn't make a dua, when they are in a situation which calls for a dua, or just generally speaking, recognizing the, the need for Allah, even when they're not in desperate need of a particular thing, they still call upon Allah. That's a sign that they're not arrogant. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِ أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنِ بَادَتِي سَيَدَخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ He says, and your Lord says, call upon me, make dua to me. Allah is commanding us to make dua. And he promises us to answer. I will answer you. Call upon me and I will answer you. Call upon me for your needs. Call upon me for something which will benefit you, not benefit me. And I will answer your prayer. He makes it an act of worship for us to ask him our needs. For, ask him for our needs. Then he says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنِ بَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ 
Those who are too arrogant to worship me, Allah is basically saying that the people who don't make dua to him are arrogant. And the people who make dua by default are not arrogant. Those people who are too arrogant to call upon me will enter, he will enter hellfire humiliated. And so this um, is the reality of a dua. It is what? Us basically showing our humility, showing our need, acknowledging, admitting our need of Allah, and that He is not of Him. Then Allah says, I am close to Him. I am indeed close to them. This qurb, this closeness, is qurbun ma'nawiyun. It is a spiritual closeness and not a physical closeness. Because our Lord, in terms of the physical, uh, His physical place, He's informed us. He is above the heavens, above His creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that throughout the Qur'an, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly. So for example, He'll say, Ar-Rahman al stowa The most merciful, Allah, He ascended over the throne. And the throne is what? The ceiling of creation. So if Allah is above the throne, He's above what? Above creation. And He tells us, for example, Amin do you feel safe from the one who is above the heavens that he will not cause the earth to swallow you up we also have uh, the hadith of the Prophet collected by Muslim slave girl he asked her he said ain't Allah where is Allah she said and she pointed to the heavens and the Prophet approved of what she said so this qurb, when Allah says, فَإِنِّي قريب, I'm close to you, it's not a physical qurb, but it's what? A spiritual qurb. And it refers to, it refers to his closeness as it relates to all of his creatures, whether they be Muslims or non-Muslims, pious worshippers or impious people. He is close to them in terms of what? His knowledge, his ilm. بِعِلْمِ Close to them in terms of his knowledge, meaning what? Knowledge is everywhere and encompasses all things. There's no place where we can go, no place where we can hide and conceal something from Allah. Allah hears and sees, and His knowledge is what is everywhere. That's as it relates to what all of His creatures, but as it relates to those who what in this context, those who worship Him and those who call upon Him with is close to them in terms of His ijaba, His responding to their supplications. Close to them in terms of his ma'una, his helping and aiding and supporting them, and his tawfiq, his making them successful in their endeavors. And so this is a special qurb, a special nearness, which has been allocated or dedicated or designated, if you will, for those who worship Allah in general and particularly with what? A dua. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on and he says, Ujibu da'wat da'i He says, I respond to the supplication of the supplicant when he calls upon me. It's a promise from Allah. I'm going to answer. Add to that the ayah that we mentioned just a few moments ago. And your Lord says, call upon me, I will answer. Another promise from Allah. And Allah doesn't break His promise. Add to that the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, collected by Ahmed, on the authority of Salman, in which the Prophet ﷺ, he said, in Allah Ta'ala layastahyi. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shy. That a servant would raise his hands to the heavens, calling upon him, asking him for something good. And that he would return those hands, that the slave would return those hands, disappointed, not having received what he asked. Indications that when we call upon Allah sincerely, Allah is going to answer, you can take it to the bank. Now when we say this, oftentimes you'll have somebody who'll object and say, muradi." He says, I call, I call upon Allah and I don't get what I want. What I ask for doesn't come to pass. And this person who says that doesn't understand, doesn't understand a few things about a dua and doesn't understand a few things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one is something that was mentioned by Shokani Ta'ala when he said, commenting on this verse, he said, Al Murad Subhana Yujibu Bimasha. What is intended is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond according to what? 
his will. He will respond the way he wants. Because why? Allah knows what's best for us and we don't know what's best for us. So Allah is going to respond. But he's going to respond the way he wants and the way that he that he deems is most befitting. Wa and however he wants. He will give you what he wants in the way that he wants to give it. فَقَدْ يَحْسُ الْمَطْلُوبِ قَرِيبًا So something we ask for happens what? It happens in short order. It happens very quickly. وَقَدْ يَحْسُ الْبَعِيدًا And sometimes it takes what? It takes some time. He knows the best place and time to place a thing. And I'll give a practical example. I know someone who um, they were expecting, anticipating the receipt of some funds. Perhaps there was some, some type of uh, reimbursement they were supposed to receive or refund or some remuneration that they were supposed to receive. And they were anticipating this. And they were anticipating coming at a certain time. And they were eager to receive it so they could buy something that they wanted. And it didn't come. And they were very disappointed and upset. And then a few weeks or a month or so or maybe a month and a half later... There was a huge, like, there was a, a calamity that, 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 that befell them. A situation where they were in desperate need of funds. And that's when the money came. Right when they needed it the most. And if that person reflected, and inshallah they reflected, that if the money had come at the time when I asked for it, and I spent it on what I wanted, I wouldn't have had it for what I needed. And so in this way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows, He knows what's best for us. So Yujib, He's going to answer. But He's going to answer, Be masha, kayfa masha, metama sha. He's going to answer with what He wants, when He wants, the way that He wants, because He knows and we don't know. Also, the second thing a lot of people don't understand who make this, um, they, they counter with this statement, Ad'u wa la yahsul muradi, I call upon Allah and I don't get what I want, is that they have to understand that there's certain asbab, there's certain causes, certain things that will increase the likelihood of our du'a being answered, but there are also some mawana. There's also some prohibitive things. There's some roadblocks. There are some things which prevent our du'a from being answered. So, for example, one thing that will bring about the answer, will, it is qalbun hadr. That when you call upon Allah, you call upon Allah with what? With a heart which is present. And a lot of times when people call upon Allah, they're just regurgitating words that they've memorized. And they're not really thinking about the meaning. And they're not praying with those qualities that we mentioned earlier. It's this out of dhul, you know, feeling that I am, you know, I'm humble and meek before Allah. I need Allah. I'm hopeless without Allah. They don't have those feelings. They're just what? They're just saying words. And it's important that the heart and the tongue are on the same page. That increases the likelihood of the du'a being accepted. Another one of the asbab is that the du'a is mashru'ah, that they're asking for something which they're allowed to ask for. Sometimes people ask for things which are haram. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to ask, answer a du'a like that. Some people ask for, for example, the approval of a loan based upon interest. Or they're ask um, for uh, Allah to facilitate a relationship with a woman, which is not halal. And so when they ask for that and they don't get it, the reason why is because the du'a was not mashru'ah. What they asked for was not what? Was not something permissible or permitted. Also, sometimes people do things that as a result of which Allah punishes them by not answering the du'a. Like people who eat and people who earn from, from non-illicit means, from, sorry, sorry, from illicit or illegal means. And we have the famous hadith where the Prophet I'm talked about a man who had a talabi his safar, he had traveled for a long distance, and he was ash'ad aghbar, his hair was disheveled, he was covered with dust, and he raised his hands to the, the heavens, and he said, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, and the Prophet said, Wa akluhu haram, wa mashrabuhu haram, wa malbasuhu haram, wa ghudhiya bil haram, he said that the man's food was haram, and his drink was from illegal sources, and his clothing was from illegal sources, and he also had been fed or, new, or nourished from illegal means or through illegal means. How can that person be answered? The Prophet said. So that's the other thing too is we have to understand sometimes we are doing things that make our du'a not be accepted. It's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has broken his promise. He never breaks his promise. He never breaks his promise. 
But sometimes we have done something or some things that cause our du'a not to be accepted or, to, or the response to be delayed. But then by that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on and says, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي Let them believe, let them respond to me, so let them respond to me and believe in me, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So that they might be guided aright. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا Let them respond to me with what? بِالطَّاعَةِ Let them respond to me with obedience. And by calling upon me as I've, as I've ordered them. Let them respond. Since I promise to answer them, let them respond by obeying me and calling upon me as I have instructed. My benefit, but for their benefit. And let them believe in me. Let them have full confidence and certainty that I am going to answer as I promised. And let them have complete trust that it will be as I said. Let them have this trust because why? That trust, that confidence, that belief is one of the vehicles, one of the causes for our du'a to be accepted. Because as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qudsi hadith, Ana B. I am as my servant thinks I am. If my servant thinks I'm going to answer, I'm going to answer. And if my servant thinks I'm not going to answer, I'm not going to answer. So we got to ask Allah with confidence, with faith, with belief, with trust. I want to mention something before we go on to the next ayah. I want you to contemplate. We started out the first ayah. Oh, you believe fasting has been prescribed for you. After that, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنُ هُدَى لِلنَّاسِ The month of Ramadan, the month in which the Qur'an was revealed as a guidance for the people. Then after that, um, I'm sorry, before that, أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودَاتِ فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفْرٍ فَيْدَةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامًا أُخَرْ It's just a fixed number of days, a few days that we have to fast. It's not the whole year. And whoever amongst you is ill or sick and is unable to, and, and, and is, is traveling, that person can fast separate days. After this ayah that we're mentioning now, Allah says, It is lawful for you on the night of the fast that you go unto your, unto your wives, or you're intimate with your wives. Everything, Shah Ramadan, Siyam, everything is about the month of Ramadan, fasting, etc. Then in the middle of that, the middle of all of that, comes an ayah, وَإِذَا سَالَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ If my servants ask you about me, I'm indeed close to them. An ayah about dua. An ayah which does not talk about fasting at all. And if you look at the series of ayat on the surface of it, you'll say to yourself, this ayah doesn't belong here. Now obviously we know it belongs there because this is the way the companions compiled the Qur'an. This is what they were instructed. This is what the Prophet was instructed. And he conveyed it to them. We know it belongs there, but I'm saying, if you go by the context of the verses, you say, this one doesn't fit. So what is it doing there? The reason why it's there in the middle of verses related to fasting is to allude to the fact, to signal, to indicate the strong connection, the correlation between the inseparable connection that's supposed to be there between fasting and dua. That they are supposed to go hand in hand and be part and parcel of, an, of one another. That basically when a person is fasting, they're supposed to make a lot of what? Of dua. That this is something which is part of fasting. It's something which should, which should, which should be part of uh, an, 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 inter, an integral part of our fast. And the Prophet has echoed this sentiment, affirmed it, and emphasized it in a number of a hadith. One of them is a hadith of al Bayhaqi on the authority of Anas, in which the Prophet ﷺ, he said, There are three people who their supplication will not be rejected, will not be turned back, it will not be turned down, it will be answered. And he mentioned among them, Asa'im Hina Yuftir, the fasting person when he breaks his fast. And another riwaya, another version of the same hadith, he said, Asa'im Hatta Yuftir. Until he breaks his fast, means that as long as he is fasting, his du'a, whatever du'a he makes, will be answered. It will be responded to. Again, making that connection 
between fasting and a dua. But now we go on to ayah number 187, the last of the ayat uh, related to fasting. And that is a statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which he said, It is being made lawful for you on the night of the fast that you go un with your wives. They are a garment for you. And you are a garment for them. Allah knows that you were betraying yourselves. You weren't betraying Allah, but you were betraying yourselves. فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَعَفَعَنْكُمْ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned to you with forgiveness and pardon. فَالْآنَ بَاشِرُهُنَّ وَبَتَغُوا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ So now go unto them and seek what Allah has written or decreed for you. وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا And eat and drink. حَتَّى يَتَبَيْنْ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَوْ مِنْ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنْ الْفَجْرِ Until the thread of dawn, the white thread of dawn, becomes clear and apparent from the black thread of night. ثُمَّ أَتِمُّ السِّيَامَ إِلَى اللَّيْلِ And then complete the fast until night comes. وَلَا تُبَاشِرُهُنَّ وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ And do not have relations with them, meaning your wives, while you are making i'tikaf, while you are secluding yourselves in the masjid. تِلْكَ حُجُودُ اللَّهِ فَلَا تَقْرَبُوهَا These are the bad so do not come close to them. كَذَلِكْ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ آيَاتِهِ لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ Likewise does Allah clarify His signs to people so that they might obtain or attain piety, God consciousness, the fear of Allah. Let's look, let's look first and foremost at the Sebab and Nuzul, so the reason or the circumstance that prompt the revelation of this ayah. As we mentioned previously, Ikhwan, in the first segment, uh, reflection, I'm sorry, this first segment, um, the first segment, reflections as we prepare for Ramadan, we mentioned that fasting was prescribed, it was prescribed in what? In stages. And one of those marahil, one of those stages of the obligation or the mandate of fasting was the stage where the fasting person at the time of Maghrib was allowed to what? To break their fast. They could eat, they could drink, and they could have relations with their spouse. So long as they didn't sleep, or they didn't offer Salat al-Isha, and whichever one came first, that immediately signaled the end of the opportunity to eat, drink, and be intimate with their spouse. Remember that state? We talked about that in the first segment. So... Ayah, the reason for the revelation of this ayah was one of two or both incidents that occurred while this was the way that fasting was prescribed. One of them is the story that we told previously as well of the Ansari man who he came home from working in the fields. And he came to his wife at the time of Maghrib, the time of fast breaking, and he said, do you have anything to eat? She said, no, 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 but I'll go out and get you something. Just wait here. So when she came back, he had fallen asleep and she said, Ya khaybatallak. She said, oh, you lost. You lost the opportunity. Why did you fall asleep? So he went out the next morning to the fields and he fainted from hunger. And that's one of the things that prompted, one of the incidents that prompted the revelation of this verse. The second incident mentioned by the scholars of Tafsir is that some of the Muslims, were unable to be patient and to restrain themselves at night from eating and drinking and being intimate with their spouses. That after they had slept or after they had performed Salat al-Isha, they did eat, they did drink, and they were intimate with their spouses. And some of them actually came to the Prophet and complained, Oh, Master of Allah, we're not able to fulfill um, the obligation. We're falling short. We're doing the wrong thing. We're not complying with the order of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses, lightening the restrictions and making it easy for them. 
And um, so the verse, it says, uh, It is lawful for you on night of the fast to go unto your wives. You are a garment for them and they are a garment for you. And the word garment here has a number of meanings. And the scholars of Tafsir have mentioned one of them is second, that a husband and a wife are a source of peace and tranquility for one another. Another meaning is firash, a bed, literally, a bed, which means they are a means of, um, of gratification, if you will. Number three, lihafun or lithaf. They are a wrapper. A wrapper. And the scholars of Islam mentioned that what's implied by this meaning is that they are extremely close to each other. They are supposed to be extremely close to each other. And last but not least, sitr. They are a cover. Something which conceals and hides the faults, the shortcomings, the idiosyncrasies of the other spouse. And this is a significant, it's very beautiful, that in the course of this discussion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He highlights the tremendous benefit and importance of a spouse or a partner. To have someone who is this close to you and who has these qualities of being a libas, someone who gives you peace and tranquility, that after you've been beaten up by the world outside the home, you come home and this person is someone that you can let your guard down. Not only can you let your guard down and they won't beat on you, whether physically or emotionally, or um, uh, mentally, psychologically, verbally. Not, with, not only will they not beat on you, but they will lift you up. They will nurse those wounds and make you feel stronger so that you can go out the next day and face the world again. Also, Firash, there's someone who will help you protect your private parts from doing what? Doing illicit things. Also, Lihaf, Lifaf, someone who is extremely close to you, someone you can lean on and be with and that person is like your soulmate. They are the yin to your yang. And also sitter, someone who knows things about you which you would be ashamed for other people to know. And they keep those things secret and concealed. And so you can feel safe and secure. You can feel vulnerable with them. And this is something which is a tremendous um, benefit, a tremendous commodity, something which... Those who have it have to know how to appreciate it, have to appreciate that spouse, have to appreciate that partner. And those who really know the value of it are those who are deprived of it, subhanAllah. And the Prophet ﷺ, he kind of alluded to and emphasized the importance of this and the value of it in the one hadith, which he mentioned about women, but it's also applicable to men. He said, a dunya mata. He said, this world, this life is commodities. And the best commodity of this world is a righteous wife, a good woman. And wallahi, yani sadaq. And not that the Prophet has me, needs for me to say he told the truth, but he told the truth. Anybody, uh, any man who goes out in this world and has to deal with what we have to deal with to survive and to make a living, to have somebody you can come home to and they prop you up, and no matter how many people tell you outside the home that you're no good and you'll never be anything and you'll never do anything, to be able to come home to somebody who tells you, no, you can do it. You're a good person. You're a good man. You're a good believer. You're this, you're this, you're this. I mean, come on, man. There's, there's nothing like that, which is why the prophet said the best thing a man can have is a good woman. And sahih and the same is true. On the opposite side, the best thing a woman can have is a good man. The verse goes on, Allah knows that you were deceiving yourselves. He knows that some of you were not complying with the obligation. Some of you were eating, some of you were drinking, some of you were being intimate with your wives when you're not supposed to. Allah knows that. You didn't hide that from Allah. Don't think that you hid it from Allah. Allah knew it. But, taba alaykum wa afankum. But Allah inclined toward you with forgiveness and he pardoned you. Look at the mercy of Allah. Look at his forgiveness. 
Look at his kindness and graciousness. He didn't expose them. He didn't say Allah knows that Ahmed was doing it, that Zayd was doing it, that Omar was doing it. He didn't expose them. He says, I know that some of you were doing that. He hid their fault. Didn't punish them. He could have punished them, but he didn't punish them. Didn't order them to repeat the fast in order to make up the days that they had, they had basically broken their fast. And he didn't penalize them. Didn't say to those people who have done that, they have to pay this fine. They have to um, do this extra act of worship. He didn't penalize them. Look at the mercy of Allah. Instead, he lightened the restriction upon them and made it easy for them to comply with the command to fast. SubhanAllah. Then Allah goes on and he says, وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيْنْ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنْ الْخَيْطُ الْأَسْوَدُ مِنْ الْفَجَرُ ثُمَّ أَتِمُّ السِّيَامَةَ إِلَى اللَّيْلِ He says, eat and drink until the white thread of dawn becomes apparent black thread, or can be distinguished from the black thread of night uh, and then complete the fast until nightfall. And this is from the evidences that the duration of fasting is from the crack of dawn until one of the evidences that this is the duration or length or the time frame of the fasting in Islam. Allah goes on to say, Do not have relations with them while you are making itikab, you are secluding yourselves in the mosque. And this is an ishara, an allusion to the sunnah, to the recommended practice of an itikab, secluding ourselves in the mosque. And this is further supported by the hadith of Bukhari Muslim. And the thought of Aisha, when she said, And the Nabi Sallallahu She said that the Prophet Sallallahu used to uh, seclude himself in the mosque in the last 10 days of Ramadan until Allah took his soul, caused him to pass from this world. And then after that, his wives continued the practice and they would seclude themselves in the mosque um, after him, after his passing. And this i'tikaf is mustahabbatun, I'm sorry, mustahabbun bil ijma. It is something which is recommended, a recommended practice by agreement of the scholars. And there are a few ahkam I want to mention ala ujala quickly before we close related to i'tikaf. The first one is that it is something which is prohibited for the one who has a hadith akbar. So that would mean a woman who is in her uh, her menstrual period, the time of her uh, her monthly visitor, she could not make i'tikaf. Also, a man who had a hadith on akbar, um, he could also not attend the mosque. He would have to leave the mosque before having seclusion and remove that hadith al akbar. Uh, the second thing is that la yakunu illa fi masjid. It has to be done in a masjid. You can't make it to cab in your home. It has to be done in the masjid. And it doesn't have to be a masjid in which Jumu'ah is held or conducted. So it doesn't have to be, or, or observed, if you will. So it can be in what we call a musalla, but it has to be what? A masjid, a place where people come and they make the congregational prayers. Uh, also, um, it is seclusion. What is al itikaf? It is secluding yourself with the niyyah, with the intention of remaining in the mosque. So what that means is that if a person simply has the niyyah of leaving the mosque, his itikaf is what? Batala. It becomes what? Invalid. That you have to be in the mosque with the knee of what? Staying in the mosque. And the only exception is the person who left the mosque, lihaja. He left the mosque because of what? Because of a, uh, uh, because of a, um, a real need, a valid need, necessity. So for example, let's say he's in a mosque where they don't allow any food in the mosque. And he has to eat. So he leaves, there's like for example a halal restaurant a block away from the masjid. He leaves to get food. He takes the food and then he returns. That would be what? An exception to the rule. But if he stays longer than required to fulfill his need, then his etikaf would be what? It would be invalidated. Also, the scholars of Islam have mentioned that yushtarat sawm or siyam lil etikaf. That a person who's making etikaf in order for it to be valid, he has to be fasting at the time of the etikaf. And this is the opinion of the Sahaba, or the one Allah Ta'ala, alayhim, among them Aisha, Umar, and Ibn Abbas. They are all of the opinion and have, um, and have given verdicts or issued verdicts saying 
that in order for a person to make it to itikaf, they have to be fasting. That those two things go hand in hand, fasting and itikaf. But um, we have to understand this too, this is very important because it's a common like uh, trend that people who make itikaf in the mosque, um, they take it as if like it's like uh, you're camping out in the mosque or you're having a sleepover at the mosque. So they just come to the mosque, they have their sleeping bag and their pillows and whatever, and they just sleep the whole day. And they call it etikaf. No, etikaf, the intention behind etikaf is for a person to seclude himself in the mosque to dedicate his time to the worship of Allah and to exert himself in that worship. And that is the reality of the etikaf. And that's, there's no real etikaf without that. And so we have to make that point. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he closes the surah, or closes the, the, the series of ayat related to fasting by saying, Tilka hududullahi fala These are the boundaries or the limits of Allah. And so do not come close to them. Do not come near to them. And so basically the, the meaning of the ayah is that these are the limits. All that you've read and studied thus far from 183 through 187, these are the limits or boundaries of Islamic fasting. So do not exceed them. And he uses the word, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوهَا Which actually means don't come close to them. Doesn't mean it doesn't go beyond them. Actually means don't even come close to what? Close to what? Those boundaries. And this is a mubalagha. An example emphasis. As if to say, and, or, to, or to allude to the qa'idah, to allude to the principle that says, إِذَا أَنَّ اللَّهَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَلَىٰ إِذَا حَرَّمَ شَيْئًا حَرَّمَ كُلَ الْوَسَائِلْ إِلَيْهِ that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits something, He prohibits not just that thing, but every wasila, every means and path that can lead to that thing. So don't just do what you've been commanded and avoid what you've been prohibited, okay? But avoid what you've been prohibited and put some distance between you and the prohibition. Don't come close to it. Don't come near to it. Because coming, if you come near to it, what's likely to happen is you're going to what? You're going to fall, fall into it. And with that, we have concluded the commentary on the ayat of related to fasting. Wallah alhamd. And inshallah ta'ala, next week, what we will do is we will begin to talk about some of the more specific ahkam that were not mentioned in the ayat that we commented on. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us what will benefit us and to benefit us, to make us from those who benefit from what they are taught, what they learn. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you all, your families, and all the Muslims from every harm and injury, including COVID-19. We also ask, Allah, we ask you all um, to stay safe and to stay healthy uh, and to protect yourselves and your family, doing what we've been advised to do to protect ourselves. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.